9 o'clock on uh, Thursday, the, what is it, the 8th or the 7th. So I'm glad to have our uh, House Republican Caucus press here again. I'm Representative Dan Sadler from District 13. Um, I'm going to give my brief opening statement and let our, my colleagues share theirs, and we'll get to your questions. I just, uh, along with some colleagues here, came from the House Community and Regional Affairs Committee, where I was very pleased to be part of a unanimous vote to support House Bill 148. That is uh, Representative Mike Schnall's bill to provide for a emergency road surface areas on uh, land that goes uh, about 100 miles of Sterling and Seward Highway that goes through National Forest. Uh, they have been providing, uh, the Kenyatta Peninsula Borough has been providing emergency services on their own dime. And with this bill, they will be allowed to use part of their federal payment in lieu of taxes from the uh, Chugach National Forest to pay for that, which I think is an innovative way to provide for Alaskans' needs and shows how our uh, minority is still providing creative solutions that help Alaskans uh, meet their challenges. I'd like to call on my colleague, Representative Tol uh, excuse me, Tammy, for her first uh, comment. Thank you. I appreciate it. As you all know, we're up in finance and we're doing amendments. Um, we'll finish up probably today or, or, or tomorrow. I guess what I want to put on point is that a lot of the amendments that I put forth, I really wanted to have a conversation. And I'm really disappointed that that's not what's happening. Many of them, you just have somebody reacting to it, we do a close, and then it's voted on. We have to look inside each and every budget to see where we can decrease the budget and, and that's the point of having the conversations. It's not really sometimes about it going up or down. It's having the conversation on whether or not this is something government should be doing. And if not, how can we step it down so the program does have a chance to go outside and look for other funding? Dave? Oh, well, thank you very much. And um, I just want to mention that uh, in some of the other committees and resources, we've been uh, having public hearings on HB 111 oil and uh, gas tax credit bill and um, I think very exciting information that was announced this morning via Repsol and Armstrong was uh, the uh, horseshoe pica combination fields they're they're talking about uh, new oil discovery which has a potential to eventually be 400,000 barrels a day I think that is that is huge news hopefully there'll be more of that coming out in the very near near future and we'll have more details but uh, that's big news thank you dude George. Yeah, thank you. Uh, nope. Right now we've got uh, in other areas around the Capitol, uh, we've got a, I've got a bill, HB6, uh, that uh, has to do with Jonesville and the public use area out there. Uh, I also have a bill uh, which regards to the permanent fund and how it uh, should be spent and the vote by the people there. It's HB uh, 161. We've got the House bill, or it's actually it's a HJR 10, which is an antiquities bill. That should be heard next week, I believe. Uh, I'm sorry, the Jonesville will be heard next week. I don't have a date for the antiquities bill yet. Very good. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to call my fellow New Yorker reader, uh, Nat to uh, get the first question. Apparently you missed the last one, so we'll give you the first crack at this one, Nat. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, <clears throat> Representative Rauscher, I'm curious about your, uh, the, the permanent fund legislation that you were referring to. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and why you're proposing it? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, I think that this is a, uh, it's an important bill. I think it's important that the people have a chance to uh, vote whether or not the permanent fund uh, should be uh, uh, paying for a government that we're probably not even going to reduce this year. And uh, if you're, uh, you know, we need to be careful when we start using the permanent fund and how we approach that every year uh, if we're contemplating such a uh, drastic deviation from what we've uh, been accustomed to over the years and the directive we've operated under I think it's important that the people have a right to say how that should happen do you, um, do you think that uh, if your legislation fails this year that you would support or, or actively promote a referendum on whatever permanent fund legislation were to pass I'm not sure whether I've looked that far into it yet. I think that there's a lot of different uh, different venues, different ways that this all could end up right now. Uh, the Senate is looking at the, uh, the permanent fund one way. I believe both sides of the House are looking at it in a different way. It's really hard to say how all that would end up to make a statement on what I would actually do in those cases. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Nat. Is uh, Becky here? Who's next? 
<clears throat> Austin Baird from KTU. On the proposed budget cuts, I guess uh, why not find a way to pass these last year when you controlled the House Finance Committee and the House overall? For anyone who'd like to answer that. We did pass a lot of those last year, but the, the, the process was different. So in subcommittee is when you heard those amendments. They were actually in the subcommittee report. Those decreases, um, we had a report and amendments were put into that report and then we adopted that in finance. So you saw those decreases actually to come out of the subcommittee report and then you had a CS come, a committee substitute come out of finance that we voted on and then the only other amendments you had were those that differed from that committee substitute. This year we weren't allowed to have the same type of amendments that you see. We could only talk about certain programs. We couldn't talk about personnel. Most of the ones that I put forth, they weren't allowed in subcommittee. That's why you're seeing more of them in finance because that's where we were told to take them. Also with the new system they're using, it doesn't allow you to have a bigger amendment if you're talking about the same thing versus travel or personnel. You actually have to write it for component by component by component, which also makes many more of them. So we did have those decreases last year, absolutely. They were just done on the subcommittee level versus full finance. Liz? Uh, morning, Liz Rains with KTVA. Um, the House majority in the Finance Committee has um, has voted to put money into the budget from the cost, the earnings reserve instead of the constitutional budget reserve. So it means it doesn't need to work with the minority for votes there. But my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, they still need to work with the minority for an effective date of the bill. Um, and if so, does that what would it take for the minority to uh, give their votes for that? <laughs> Well, you know, I think the bigger issue is taking $4 billion, over $4 billion out of the earnings reserve and putting into basically a low interest savings account. We're going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars that could have been utilized to fund the budget and instead just to get around the Constitution Budget Reserve draw, they're willing to take that decrease and go after an income tax or some other way to fill that same hole that our savings could be making. And I think that's where the bigger issue is here is what is the consequences to taking out over $4 billion out of the highest earning we have. The stock market is on a soar right now and we are making a lot of money. Now if this passes, we're going to have to cash those in at an all-time high. Nobody would do that as a, as a financial manager. So why are we? Yeah. Andrew? Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Following up on Austin's question, while the, the process was different last year, the overall size of the cuts that uh, were enacted in the House budget last year weren't uh, on the level of some of the cuts that you're proposing this year. So um, I guess following up on Austin's question, um, why didn't you make larger cuts last year? Well, I think what you're talking about is, in, is are you talking about as a, as, a, as a whole majority or are you talking about as individual? Because I'll tell you right now in my subcommittees, we did make those same cuts as you're hearing right now. I went through the budget just like I did last year, gave those same suggestions to them. So, you know, on, on my part, I don't think you're seeing anything different from me than you've seen in previous years. Yeah. I, I think more as a majority is where I was going. Why, like, why wasn't the end result? Well, well I, I think that's very easy. We're stepping things down, and there was a step down last year. And as oil continues to be down, and, and although the barrels have gone up, and we've seen an increase there, when you're starting to look more and more to going after an income tax or taking more out of the earnings reserve than whatever it makes, that pressure is going to become larger and larger, which it should. And I think it's, when it gets smaller as it is now, you're going to have to look deeper down into it. So I, I think you're going to see that every year. I think you would have seen that if, if the majority was still the Republicans versus the Democrats. That pressure is there. And people, I think, are paying attention, thankfully, more than they did in previous years. Because once you take their dividend from them, something they thought nobody would ever do, that really has an impact on them. So. We have decreased. We did a lot of legislation last year with criminal reform and Medicaid reform. You're going to see those decreases this year. So the last couple of years you saw it in legislation as well as you saw it in the budget. But you have to combine the two together for the savings. Okay, Shauna? Shauna Crondall, Alaska Education Update. Can you talk about education? I don't know if that would be for Representative Wilson and Representative Tallarico. Just tell me what's going on with education. Well, I can discuss with you what we've got upcoming in the committee. And, and we've had, as, as you're aware, we've had several joint meetings with the Senate, which have been very productive. Uh, it's provided great information for us. I think 
One of the best ones that I remember was the one where we actually uh, had discussed different school districts that have shared services, which I think it should be pretty exciting for people you know, that are, that are really following education in Alaska, mostly between the uh, Copper River School District and Chugiak, which was uh, um, uh, their shared services that they, they do between those schools is pretty fascinating. Of course, it requires a lot of technology, which a guy my age doesn't understand as well as younger people for sure. But um, um, we've been pretty busy in the committee. We've got uh, three bills coming up, at least in house education. One of them is the Reading Proficiency Task Force, which we've, we've have already heard. And then uh, we have uh, HB 135. That's the school construction grant bill, which would provide uh, an extension of a couple of years so that local match um, requirements for communities um, would actually have more time to actually accumulate their local match so that they could continue forward with any of those projects. And then I believe tomorrow we're going to hear HB 137, which uh, is uh, the State Council on the Arts and the potential to have them um, converted to a public corporation. Um, which uh, several of those folks seem to be in favor of. So from, uh, from a house education standpoint, I think that's good because we're, we're going to be busy. And I think on the finance part, we need to start putting it all together and, and stop talking about them in silos. You know, we have the formula. We have transportation funding, which really is part of the formula because we give money to districts that don't even have you know, transporting students back and forth. So it's, a, it's an add-on to that, to the teacher retirement portion of it, to the bond debt, and then the school construction. We need to start talking about as as a whole and how much we're putting to education. And then are we utilizing those funds in the best way that we can? Thanks. Uh, I want to make sure, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Quinn with Thanks, Bloomberg. Um, I've asked this question before. You've talked about reducing government. At what point um, will government be right size? Because we've heard every year government's too big, and then we've heard it again in subsequent years. And I've got to follow up with the resources. Well, I'll take the first one. Um, you know, frankly, Steve, uh, the government will be the right size when we are uh, spending more along the lines of our means and when we are still meeting Alaskans' needs. Uh, there's going to be a dynamic tension. Government is a dynamic system, and things go up and down. There's no pure stasis point, but uh, we have to have a budget that more closely reflects our revenue picture. Uh, but we also need to take care of Alaskans as well. So your follow-up is? Uh, for the Resource Committee members, um, you know, you've got HB 111, um, and I know your arguments against it, but do you feel like you have a system in place right now that is affordable from top to bottom, whether it's the credits or the um, the rates. I'll take that. Well, I, I think one, one of the things, you know, we've, we're kind of uh, talking about making changes to a system where the last changes that we made haven't even gone into effect yet. Um, and when, when those changes go into effect, actually, I think that, that has a, a big impact and, and changes. I'll, there's been a lot of discussion about production tax and, you know, we pay out more than we take in. Um, actually, as time goes by, though, and a graph was even provided in the presentation of another bill, say in 2019, you know, it's uh, probably cost us about $25 million in 2018. Um, will be upside down in our production tax. The graph actually shows that in 2019, after the changes that we made take effect, we'll get about $110 million of uh, net out of the production tax. In 2020, it's estimated to be about $136 million. And as time goes by, that number will climb because we've, wh what we actually did was we got rid of those tax credits in Cook Inlet. And, but it's transitional. I think you probably all remember that half of them go away um, July 1, 2017, and then in 2018 the rest of them go away. So it's kind of a transitional thing. Um, so I think uh, my opinion is, is that we should actually 